Okay, if you'd uh, bow your heads, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' precious name, I just thank you, Lord, for uh, for this conference, all the hard work that went into it, and the, the speakers. Uh, but I thank you, Lord, most of all for the uh, the people that you you brought here. Uh, many of these people come and they they had their own ministries, or they they just serve you day and night. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, you will have used uh, those who put together this conference and the speakers that you use us to do your work through us to equip these saints uh, for the service that they have. Lord, I pray that you would help us to uh, to not just defeat atheists and, and debates, uh, but to help plant seed through the power of the Holy Spirit and to lead them uh, to your son's salvation. So I pray, Lord, that as we look at the uh, cumulative case for God, it would not be something that uh, uh, would make us puffed up, but instead would, uh, would just cause us to speak the truth in love and more effectively as we defend the faith once we're all delivered to the saints and we uh, minister to our atheist friends. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me to proclaim your truth, that you would guard my mouth and my tongue so that uh, I would not lead anyone astray. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, before we get started, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, a little commercial for the uh, the institute on the the books. We got a few books there, and I don't know if you saw Don. If you could raise your hand, Don Davidson has been helping me out and stuff, and he's he's carrying the stuff. And as you can tell, he's he's an undernourished guy. He's a, he's a little guy, and we don't want him to carry back a lot of books. So we're selling my books for five dollars a piece, and we have how many people are mathematicians? Raise your hand. We got a few mathematicians. We got the mathematician deal is five dollars a piece, but three for twenty dollars. And so, um, so uh, hopefully, uh, we sometimes we fool you know one person a year. Hey, it's an extra five bucks. We can live with it. But uh, have my God, government, and the road to tyranny, which uh, some real optimistic chapters like the coming death of Western civilization. You'll want to look into that if you're if you if you like to complain. There's a lot you can read there, and. Uh, but uh, these two books, No Other Gods, and uh, you know, No Other Gods, The Defense of Biblical Christianity, and The God Who Sits Enthroned, Evidence for God's Existence, these two books uh, will deal with a lot of what I'm talking about in this lecture right now. Especially the, the No Other Gods has a chapter on the cumulative case, whereas The God Who Sits Enthroned, the entire book is devoted uh, to studying arguments for God's existence. So... Uh, uh, at this point, we'll we'll look at my uh, my cumulative case for God's existence. I've been when I started debating uh, the existence of God on on college campuses. I used to debate the way most Christian uh, thinkers have debated the issue for for hundreds of years, and that was that because I believed that we could prove God's existence uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. That's what I would go for. But then what I figured out was uh, it really wasn't fair. I was really making it easier for the atheist to win. Now, nobody ever took me up on the offer, but, but basically when you argue to try to prove God's existence beyond all reasonable doubt, which I think you can do, what you're doing, though, is you're allowing the atheist to just raise 2 or 3% doubt, and that's enough to win the debate. I mean, when you, when you talk to the jurist, in the O.J. Simpson trial, most of them would, would say, yeah, oh, yeah, we thought he was guilty, but he got four or five of the world's greatest lawyers, and each one of them raised a little bit of doubt to where there was enough reasonable doubt and we felt like we couldn't convict. Okay? And uh, so what I, what I propose that we do is that we take uh, our dialogues with atheists out of the criminal courts and bring them into these dialogues into the civil courts where it's fair. It's the preponderance of evidence. If you prove your case with 51% probability, you win. You tip the scale in your favor, you win. And that's what I think it should be. We should tell the atheists, look, just because you can bring up a few questions that we Christians may not be able to answer, because after all, we're not God, we're not all-knowing, just because you raise a few questions that we can't answer, doesn't mean that we should therefore embrace atheism, which is an extremely weak worldview. Now, a lot of atheists would say, oh, that's too strong of a statement. But if you just look, if you just study the history of philosophy, 
you'll find only two time periods where atheism was the leading worldview. One, one a very small little pocket of time, probably only a generation or so, in ancient Greece where they were knocking down the ancient myths. And a few of the philosophers from the Milesian school seemed to be atheists, even though they also talked a little bit about the gods, but they might have been speaking figuratively there. Uh, but then guys like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle came on the scene and said, no, there's more to the world, to reality, than just the physical realm. There's the invisible realm uh, of ideas and moral absolutes and absolute truth and things of that sort. Uh, and then the 20th century, uh, atheism had its, it was kind of the atheist century. And we are leaving the atheist century. Unfortunately, we're not going back to a Christian century. We're moving towards a neo-pagan century, and that uh, that could be even worse than an atheist century. Uh, but whatever the case, uh, I think if we say, look, he, you atheist, is, the issue isn't, does God exist? I've got the burden of proof. The issue is theism, the belief in God, versus atheism, which is more reasonable. And when we level the playing field, uh, I think it becomes very obvious uh, that the, the uh, theistic worldview, belief in God, uh, is a powerful worldview, a powerful explanatory power, whereas the atheistic worldview is very weak. So in the, my cumulative case for God, you have this in your notes, so you shouldn't have to, you know, if I say something and you really like the way I said it because uh, uh, of my angelic voice or my uh, uh, Jersey poetic style or whatever it may be, you, you feel free to write it down, but basically I'm handing you notes so you don't have to write notes, okay? And uh, But what I do is I treat Christian theism as a hypothesis. I'm proposing Christian theism as an explanation of the data in question, the common experiences that we have as human beings. And then I argue that it's more reasonable to believe in God than it is to be an atheist. And that theism offers a more adequate explanation than atheism does for uh, common aspects of human experience. And we'll talk about these aspects. What happens with atheism is they either say, well, yeah, well, moral values, I believe in absolute morality and absolute moral values, but they're just there. Or they try to explain them away and say there, there are no moral absolutes. And then they can't live consistently with it. But I would argue that many of these common aspects of human experience are more obviously real or more obviously true than atheism is. And so if atheism can't explain them or explains them away, that it's, then it's time to ditch atheism, especially when they're a perfect fit with the theistic worldview. Let me say this. Theism just means the belief. When we say theism today, we almost always mean monotheism the belief in one personal God, okay? Not the non-personal force of Star Wars or the New Age movement. It's not the force be with you. It's the Lord be with you. And the three main theistic uh, religions are Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, okay? So we're arguing for, for theism. At the same time, some of my arguments for theism, you'll see, go on into Christian theism, okay? Um, uh, for instance, when I talk about Jesus as the ultimate solution to the problem of evil, well, Muslims and Jews would disagree, okay? Um, but whatever the case, uh, the, normally what I'll do is I'll argue for theism first, that a personal God exists, and then I'll begin to talk about evidence for Jesus' resurrection from the dead, historical evidence, okay? And so I usually go to history to argue that, you know, first I go to philosophy and argue that theism is the true worldview, and then I go to history to show that Christian theism is the true theistic faith, okay? And and by the way, you can go to my website, biblicaldefense.org. It's, it's on your notes. You could download over a thousand different lectures and sermons and debates that I've done, most of them audio, a few of them video, but... Um, uh, but you could take entire seminary level courses right over the internet and listen to them right over the internet, like philosophical apologetics, defending the faith using philosophy and reason, 
historical apologetics, defending the faith, using historical evidences. I have to admit, I feel way out of my element today being surrounded by all these, not only uh, speakers who are scientists, given all this scientific data that's way over my head, you know, I'm a philosopher and a theologian, uh, but then when I start, you know, people introduce themselves, people in the audience, and I'm finding out, well, this guy heads a creation science ministry, and that guy heads a creation science ministry, and this gal's part of a cre creation science ministry. It's like, you know, I'm surrounded by scientists, and that can be, that can be real intimidating, but I, I bring something to the table, and uh, maybe by going to the website and philosophical apologetics uh, and historical apologetics, maybe I can help out there. Now, the first aspect of human experience uh, that I like to talk about is the beginning of the universe. Do you realize this used to be uh, something that was debated between atheists and Christians? That uh, the uh, 19th century, okay, to the close of the 19th century, atheists said, we don't have to believe in God's existence because the universe was always here and will always be here. The universe doesn't have a beginning, therefore it doesn't need a cause. Okay? But then in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe, and that led to what is called the Big Bang model. Now, I don't, I don't hold to the Big Bang model. The Big Bang model has a lot of problems with it, okay? But I believe that the second law of thermodynamics, energy deterioration, shows us that the universe had to have a beginning because the amount of usable energy in the universe is running down, which means given enough time in the future, eventually all the energy in the universe will have been used up. The universe will be dead, will die if left to itself. if God doesn't intervene. But that means if you go backwards in time, eventually you'd reach a point that would mark the beginning of the universe where all the energy in the universe was in a usable state. Okay. So I would argue from good science, the second law of thermodynamics for the beginning of the universe. But having said that, most atheists for some reason just ignored that for like a hundred years and still argued the universe had no beginning until Edwin Hubble showed the universe was expanding in all different directions as we move forward in time. This led to the Big Bang model. So what I'm getting at is the fact that most atheist thinkers today hold to the Big Bang model, and because they do, they acknowledge that the universe had a beginning. So it used to be the universe doesn't need a cause because it didn't have a beginning. Now atheists will argue, and these are some of America's leading atheists. I'll give you two examples on that as well. But they now argue that the universe had a beginning, but it doesn't need a cause. That somehow the universe popped into existence out of nothing, totally without a cause, and we're okay with that. Michael Martin, you can download from my website my debate with Dr. Michael Martin. He used to be a philosophy professor at Boston University, one of America's leading atheists. You can also download it from uh, Internet Infidels, the world's largest atheist website. They invited me to debate Martin, and in that debate, he admitted that he believed that the universe popped into existence totally out of nothing, totally without a cause, and he doesn't see any problem with that. Okay? Um, but what I'm getting at is that atheists acknowledge the beginning of the universe. By the way, I use the second law of thermodynamics, a scientific principle to prove the universe had a beginning. Atheists believe in the Big Bang model, which I don't think is true, but at the same time, that would still argue that the universe had a beginning. See, if it's expanding in all directions as we move forward in time, it means as you go backwards in time, the universe is getting more and more dense. Okay? The reason why I don't hold to the Big Bang is, I don't know, you know, Russell Humphreys came up with Christian thinker. You can buy his book out there, Starlight and Time. He has a model of the universe that answers more questions than the Big Bang does. Um, yet, he has the universe only getting smaller 40 times, and then and God created it at a certain size. Okay? So we don't know. We You have to assume uh, naturalism that there's no nothing influencing this universe from the outside, that it wasn't created by God just to get the Big Bang off the ground. But um, whatever the case, you could even go to philosophy and argue that the universe had a beginning, even apart from science. For instance, there's this thing called time. Okay, You have a past, a present, and a future. 
Now, if, if, if we reach the present moment now, that means that we have already traversed all the past moments of time, okay? The problem is, if, if time is eternal, if the universe is eternal, there would have to be an infinite, a non-limited number of moments in the past. But So to reach the present moment now, you would have to traverse or pass through an actual infinite number of moments to reach the present moment now. Okay? But it's impossible to traverse an actual infinite set of moments. Because no matter how many moments you would have traversed, there'd still be an infinite number more to go. Now, I don't want to get off into uh, Zeno's paradoxes, but if you know if you had a philosophy course, <clears throat> they talked about Zeno's paradoxes. Zeno thought he was proven more than he actually was proving, but he did prove the impossibility of traversing an actual infinite set of finite points. So, since we have reached the present moment now, the number of past moments is a finite limited number. There had to be a first moment in time. Time was created. By the way, proponents of the Big Bang uh, model acknowledge that space, time, and matter slash energy had a beginning at that initial uh, uh, second of the Big Bang. Okay, so, uh, so basically you can argue that time had to have a beginning and just to reach the present moment now, we've reached the present moment now, therefore there had to be only a limited number of moments in the past. There had to be a first moment, therefore the universe um, had a beginning. Well, whatever has a beginning needs a cause, okay? Now, I was talking to a, to a gentleman yesterday. I don't even know if he's here right now, and, but a, a gentleman who, who, uh, who is not a Christian, and we were talking last night, and he thought what I was saying was that everything has to have a cause. Well, no knowledgeable Christian argues that way. Christian philosophers throughout the centuries don't argue that way. We don't argue that everything needs a cause. We argue that everything that has a beginning needs a cause, so eventually you have to arrive at something that is totally uncaused, the uncaused cause of all else that exists. Okay? Um, so everything that has a beginning has to have a cause. It couldn't cause itself to exist. It couldn't be self-caused, because then it would have to pre-exist its own existence in order to bring its own existence about. That's absurd. Okay? Um, it couldn't pop into existence out of nothing. Nothing doesn't have the power to create. Um, see, in order to have potential to do something, you've got to be something actual. Only actual things have potential. If you're not actually anything, you have no potential because there's nothing there to have potential. Okay? So nothing doesn't have the power to do anything. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nothing. Okay? And so this is, this is what's, this is what's great about being a philosopher. Scientists have to talk about something, okay? Well, maybe with the exception of Dawkins, but um, uh, sometimes he doesn't talk at all, like that video clip. But, but, um, but whatever the case, if you're a philosopher, sometimes they pay you to talk about nothing. And so I think it's a great deal. But whatever the case, uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nothing. And it's interesting, that's how it looks at Marx, who, off a good philosopher. A good philosopher could talk all day about nothing. And, um, but nothing is just profound. This is some of the most profound stuff I've ever said. So if you're taking notes, get ready with your pens right now. Nothing is nothing. Okay, there's a few oohs and ahs on that. Okay. Nothing is nothing. Okay. I know it's hard to believe, but face it. You know, nothing is nothing. Therefore, nothing can do nothing. Therefore, nothing can cause nothing. If the universe had a beginning, since whatever has a beginning needs to cause something else, something apart from the universe had to cause it to come into existence. Now, the universe is all that nature is. So whenever you find natural causes, where do you find them? In nature, in the universe. So if, the whole, if all of nature needs a cause, by definition, the cause of the universe must be supernatural okay now a lot of people act like well that's not good science 
science only accepts natural causes. No, no. That's a total, a total misunderstanding of science held by many scientists today because they're indoctrinated in that. Scientists are supposed to study nature and then find causes. And, but if the causes end up being supernatural causes, so be it. But to say that we will only accept natural causes is not science. That's scientism. That's a religion of atheistic materialism that's forced on the data. It's not something we receive from the evidence uh, itself. So right now the debate between um, Christians and atheists is that we're supposed to be the guys with all the blind faith because we believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, yet the brilliant people of our day are really teaching in the beginning nothing created the heavens and the earth. Now you tell me, you tell me what is more reasonable, okay? I believe that in the beginning a miracle working God had the power to create the universe and did so. Nothing has no power. I, I have I had some Japanese uh, students that were Buddhist that came to King's West, the Christian high school that I taught at, and I asked them, "Well, how did everything, how did everything get here?" And they talked to each other, and then their spokes lady said, "Big Bang." She said, "Everything got here through the Big Bang." And uh, uh, I said, "Well, how did the Big Bang come about?" And then they talked with each other, and, and one of them said, uh, it's a miracle? And I said, no. I said, nothing can't do miracles. I believe in a miracle-working God. Miracles are okay with me. But you can't have a miracle-working nothing, okay? And I pointed to the weight room. I said, I lift weights. I have the power to lift weights, but I don't have the power to make everything. Nothing doesn't have the power to lift weights. Yet you say nothing made everything? We're being lied to. Either in the beginning God or in the beginning nothing. They didn't call me a fool, but uh, I just I know too much about nothing. Um, okay, then the continuing existence of the universe. This is Thomas Aquinas' third way to argue. He had five ways to argue for God's existence. This is his third way. I like it. You either get it or you don't. But uh, there's two two ways of uh, of saying it. So basically, one way of saying this is, is that uh, dependent things exist. Okay, uh, like for instance, I'm a dependent being. I depend on on air, on water, on food for my for my continuing existence. Okay, I knew guys in New Jersey. They're in their mid thirties and they still dependent on their mother for their continuing existence, living in the basement and all. But uh, but if everything that exists is a dependent being, then when you put them all together, you get one big, giant, dependent being. The only way to ground the existence of all dependent existence is to have a totally independent being. Okay, That's one way to argue for this. The way that I like is a little bit more abstract, but... If everything that exists has the possibility of non-existence, then given enough time in the future, given enough time, every possibility will be actualized. Every possible scenario will obtain. So that the scenario where everything with the possibility of non-existence will not exist will come about. So given enough time, if everything that exists has the possibility to not exist, given enough time in the future, eventually nothing will exist. But then there's a problem, says Thomas Aquinas, because then if you go backwards in time, that same scenario would have obtained if you go back and back into the past where nothing would have existed. But since from nothing, nothing comes, something has to be eternal with no beginning and no end, and no possibility of non-existence, what philosophers call a necessary being, and that would ground the continuing existence of all the possible beings that exist. So this is an argument for God not as the cause 
of the beginning of our existence, like the last argument was, this is an argument uh, for the cause of our continuing existence. This is an argument for God as the one who sustains us uh, in existence. So something has to be eternal and have uh, no possibility of non-existence. By the way, if, you, if there's some of these arguments that you don't get, don't worry about it. You don't have, you probably, your neighbor's probably not going to give you, you know, six hours to, to talk all of these. Find four or five that you really feel comfortable with, okay? Uh, if, if you, if you master like 13 or 14, then you can find out, okay, which four or five might speak to my neighbor? Because they might not like a few of these and others they would like. Uh, the design and order in the universe. We've had, you know, some brilliant scientists up here giving you all evidence for the intricate design, like the complexity of the human eye and things of that sort that could not get here by chance. Okay? Um, if I was, uh, you know, if, if I was up here uh, eating, eating cereal on a stage, I talked about this on the radio yesterday, and uh, if I was eating alphabet cereal, now, how many people here are, are uh, uh, Seahawk fans? Raise your hands. Oh, good. Things are getting better. There's a very small percentage. Good. Because I'm a Raider fan, and uh, and I, I feel I feel the love in this room, so I can admit that, even though they only won two games last year. And uh, but but if if I was having cereal there, and then I got up and walked away, and Chris came up, and he saw by my cereal bowl where it said Raiders rule outside the bowl, okay? He's not going to say, how about that? That's amazing that the cereal just fell out of the box and it just spelled out Raiders rule. No, he's going to know. He's going to Fernandez is a Raider fan and he spelled that out. And even if I deny it, he's going to know I'm lying or somebody else did it because Raiders rule is enough to tell us. I don't care. I don't care if your name is Carl Sagan. Raiders rule. Now, of course, after last year, you might you might say, okay, well, that's not really a good example of of intelligence, but but whatever the case, um, uh, but Raiders rule that would be enough for Carl Sagan to immediately know intelligent design. But when that intelligent design points towards God, that's when he starts thinking differently and inconsistently. See, a single-celled animal contains enough genetic information to fill 20,000 volumes of encyclopedia. You'll get that from the world's leading atheist uh, scientist. By the way, those numbers seem to go up every few years as they learn more and more about the uh, uh, genetic information of a single-celled animal. It sometimes they'll say uh, uh, enough to fill um, a thousand complete sets of encyclopedia. Well, encyclopedia usually has about 20 volumes, okay? almost one for each letter or the alphabet, you know, X and Y, you can put in one, you know, that type of thing. And so uh, so that's about 20,000 volumes of encyclopedia. You can't get that amount of information. The illustration often given is how many explosions, random explosions would have taken a print shop before out would pop a Webster's Dictionary. It's not going to happen. It takes intelligent design. Um uh, the Big Bang model. Now, I, I, evolutionists are getting away from the Big Bang as an explosion, and they're talking about it more as inflation. That's, there's a good reason for that. Because when evolutionists try to act like there was this big explosion, there was absolutely nothing, and then all of a sudden, somehow, there was this big explosion that produced all the order and complexity we have in the world today. And as we move forward in time, that explosion is still producing more order and more complexity. That is not, excuse me, that's not a scientific statement. We've had plenty of explosions that we were able to examine the effects of those explosions. I remember the Oklahoma City bombing, okay? The Oklahoma City building started out orderly and complex, and then it was nothing but chaos and disorder after the explosion. Explosions take things from a state of um, order and complexity to a state of disorder and chaos, okay? So the idea that, the, that they could just appeal to the Big Bang just doesn't work. Dr. Hoyle and Dr. Wick Ramesing, two of Great Britain's leading uh, evolutionists, two of their greatest scientists, 
studied, you know, they wanted to know what, what exactly are the chances of life evolving from non-life without intelligent intervention. And these, these two guys, they were atheists, they came up, to, they came to the conclusion that it would be the same as the, the chance of a random tornado running through a junkyard and accidentally producing a fully functional Boeing 747. In other words, what they were saying to their atheist colleagues is this, boys, we got problems, okay? And uh, now, I would like to, I would like to say, and Hoyles and, Hoyles and Wigrama Singh are now two Bible-believing Baptists, but that's not the case. They went from uh, atheistic absurdity to somewhat of, well, it's, it's just kind of, I don't know what kind of absurdity, but, but now they hold to panspermia. They believe that uh, alien life, intelligent alien life, somehow seeded the planet Earth. And so in, intelligent uh, life coming from here can be traced back to intelligence in outer space, and then you would say, well, where did that intelligence come from? Well, Hoyle and Gramersing says, ah, you know, at, we can now postpone that question at least until we die comfortably as uh, as non-Christians or whatever. But I would, uh, you know, I'd hope that they would come uh, come to Christ out of this. So, design and order uh, in the universe. Another, uh, another, you know, um, who I can't remember if it was. Uh, if it was Frank Sherwin who was up here and showing, or if it was the other gentleman uh, who was showing us so many of the things, so many of the complex things that we have designed, just like in the last three to five years, uh, we found things in nature that follow those same principles, only they were much more complex, much more sophisticated. So for, to, you know, for an atheist to, to, to deny design, intelligent design in nature is absurd. I mean, Michael Behe, with his irreducible complexity, has shown on the submolecular level, um, we have things that are more complex than computers and spaceships, and then they're irreducibly complex. You remove one part, it wouldn't continue to exist long enough to evolve into something else. They had to be created that way. And the complexity is the level of a computer or a spaceship. If that doesn't show evidence of design, I don't know what does. Uh, the possibility of human knowledge, another aspect um, of human experience, human reason. Could consciousness and our thinking ability randomly evolve from matter? You know, do, re do we really think that the laws of logic and mathematical principles evolve from mud? Does that really make sense? But that's, you know, that's pretty much the reigning theory on our college campuses today. Uh, I think it's much more reasonable to believe that we were created by a rational being and in his image so that therefore human reason works. Now the atheist could say, well, maybe human reason doesn't work. Well, you're, then why do you tell me that uh, atheism is rational? You reason to atheism, so you must think that reason works. This was one of C.S. Lewis's major arguments against atheism is that naturalism, or the belief that only nature exists, only physical things exist, no spiritual things exist, no supernatural things exist, that the only things that exist, exist in this box called nature, and they're all physical things. Well, guess what? Reason doesn't work unless it's something that exists outside that box. Okay? Uh, C.S. Lewis would put it this way, there's no basis for human reason, for reason with a small r, unless there's reason with a capital R, okay? Um, and so it's more reasonable that uh, we were created by a rational being and in his image uh, than human reason somehow evolved from primordial soup. The existence, very similar to that, the existence of universal, eternal, unchanging truths. Uh, by the way, many atheists deny absolute tr the existence of absolute truth. What's wrong with that? As I mentioned in my last talk, when you say there is no absolute truth, the only way for that to be true would be if it's an absolute truth. Okay? So the statement, there is no absolute truth, is self-refuting. It has to be false. Therefore, its opposite must be true. Absolute truth uh, exists. So, um, uh, but whatever the case, the laws of logic and mathematics, 
most, most atheists are materialist, only matter exists. Well, then what, what is the thought? What are values like justice and, and, and love? What is, it, what is truth? See, if atheism is true, then there's no such thing as truth, then atheism cannot be true. So whenever an atheist takes a debate, he's actually lost. If he's a consistent atheist and he denies absolute truth, then his argument that atheism is true can't be true. Because if he's right, there is no such thing as truth. So uh, when I debated Dan Barker at Bellevue Community College, I asked him, I said, how much does a thought weigh? So I want to find out, are you a consistent atheist or not? And, you know, if he says, no, you can't weigh thoughts, they're non-material, then I'd say, wow, that's really strange uh, furniture for a world without God. That's really strange furniture for an atheistic world. Uh, but I knew he was a consistent atheist, and I knew he would respond the way he did. He said, oh, you can weigh a thought. And I said, are you saying that a thought is some kind of chemical reaction that occurs inside somebody's brain? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he kept bringing up Timothy McVeigh blowing up the Oklahoma City buildings before 9-11 uh, as evidence against God. Why would an all-good God allow that to occur? And so he was using that as an example of evil. And so, so basically what I said was, well, then how come you keep slamming Timothy McVeigh when he was just responding to a brain squirt? You see, when, when again, if, you, if this gentleman up here catches a cold, you're not going to say, man, that was messed up. Why did you do that, man? Why did you choose to get, catch a cold? That was something that was biologically determined. Okay? You know, these germs came in and started messing with him. His immune system couldn't fight him off. That wasn't something that he decided. That was biologically determined. You know, if atheism is true, then uh, there's no human soul. If atheism is true, there's no absolute truth. If atheism is true, there's really no such thing as thoughts. If atheism is true, um, our decisions are biologically determined. In fact, B.F. Skinner, an atheist, behavioral scientist, argued exactly that in his book, Beyond Freedom and Human Dignity. And he argued there is no such thing as free will. Now, if you're going to be consistent with that worldview, we need to shut down our prisons immediately and set the captives free because what they did was biologically determined. You're a nice guy. Well, great, but you're just biologically determined to be nice. The guy down the block is just biologically determined to be a serial murderer. It's not his fault uh, unless uh, there are eternal unchanging truths, unless there does exist a non-material soul, uh, unless we do have thoughts and we do make choices. Then, you know, if that's the case, then we can be held responsible for our actions. Whatever the case, atheists, how can atheists argue that atheism is true when they can't, their worldview isn't even strong enough um, to, uh, to hold a concept such as truth? Uh, universal, eternal, unchanging moral laws. Let me tell you something. Everybody uh, has uh, moral experiences. I don't care if it's an atheist. Atheists could say there's no such thing as absolute moral laws. And then tomorrow they'll protest because uh, somebody somebody brought their Bible to a, to a school, a public school or something. You know, some fifth grade, fifth grade girl wrote a paper on Jesus and they'll be protesting. And they'll have moral outrage even though they believe there's no such thing as right and wrong. Uh, everybody has moral experiences. And uh, at least, you know, C.S. Lewis said, even moral relativists, people who say there's no such thing as right and wrong, each person decides, even moral relativists acknowledge the existence of evil when they're the one that was wronged. Okay? Um, now, I'm not suggesting you punch an atheist in the face to make a point, uh, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is, they're, they're, they're acting like there's no such thing as right and wrong, but then when they get wronged, they scream and complain, scream and complain as much as the Christian does when, when we're wrong. So there is this moral standard. Now what they could say is, yeah, all right, there's a moral standard, but it comes from the individual. There's no higher moral standard than the individual. Each individual decides what is right or what is wrong for himself or herself. 
There's a problem with that, though. Because then one individual can't condemn the actions of another individual as wrong. So in other words, the atheist wouldn't be able to condemn the actions of Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or Osama bin Laden as wrong. But even the atheist wants to condemn their actions as wrong, so when they do, whether they admit it or not, they're appealing to a moral standard above individuals. So then what could the atheist say? Well, the atheist could say, all right, so the moral standard's above individuals, but maybe it's each society decides what is right or what is wrong. But then you have the same problem. One society, like America, would not be able to condemn the actions of another society, like Nazi Germany or the Taliban, as wrong. When we condemn the actions of another society, we're appealing to a standard above those societies. I mean, even atheists try to make our society a better place to live. I think they do a bad job at it, but they try to make our society a better place and they protest. So they're appealing to a moral standard above individuals and above societies. So they might say, okay, well then maybe it comes from a world consensus. Well, the world consensus has a really bad track record. Okay, world consensus used to be slavery is perfectly permissible. It's just a part of life. Get used to it. World consensus used to be the woman has no rights. She's just the property of the man. The world consensus uh, used to be at one time that the world is flat. The world consensus has been wrong in the past. What makes us think it's going to be right now? It's got it's got a bad track record. But the fact of the matter is, even atheists try to build a better world. Even atheists appeal to a moral standard above all individuals, above all societies, and above the world consensus when they try to build a better world. You know, and the other thing, too, is atheists think, well, we've built a better world today than we had in the past because now we've outlawed, at least in the West, slavery, and then when women have equal rights and all. So we build a better world than there was in the past, but we want to build an even better world in the future. They're acting like there's a moral standard above all individuals, above all societies, above any world consensus, and they're acting like it's a moral standard that is eternal and unchanging. It doesn't change with time. Okay? The problem is, if you've got a moral standard above all individuals, all societies, any world consensus, and it doesn't change with time, then you need a moral lawgiver. Above all individuals, all societies, any world consensus, and the moral lawgiver does not change with time. Okay. See, moral laws, they don't tell us, they don't describe the way things are. They prescribe the way things ought to be. Prescriptive laws need a prescriber. If you try to get a prescription drug without the, the, the doctor's signature, they're not going to give it to you. Okay. And so, uh, and so I say the existence of moral laws, even, just look, look, don't listen to what the atheist says. Watch what he does. When he protests and tries to make the world a better place to live, he's living on what Cornelius Van Til called borrowed capital from the Christian worldview. See, if you deny reality, if you deny Christianity is true, there's not enough money in the atheist bank account. So they have to borrow capital from the Christian worldview. It's like what Humanist Manifesto number two, they said that in regards to uh, morality, I mean, uh, sexuality, um, that they are for any sex between consenting adults. And this is right after they said that ethics are autonomous and situational. In other words, each person determines for himself or herself what is right or what is wrong. And then two paragraphs later, uh, they say that we're for all forms of sex between consenting adults. Well, wait a minute here. If you're for sex between consenting adults, you're saying you're opposed to rape, and you're opposed to pedophilia. But you just got done saying that ethics is autonomous. Each person determines what is right and what is wrong. So what they do is they say anything goes, and then they resurrect a few of God's commandments because we just can't live without them. Okay? They're living on borrowed capital from the uh, Christian worldview. So we can point to morality. Uh, moral laws. Um, this is stuff we already covered here. Okay, the meaning of life purpose. You realize if God does not exist and there's no life after death, there's no punishments and rewards, uh, then life is a, a, a absurd. 
It's irrelevant whether you live your life like Corey Ten Boom and rescued innocent Jewish people and, and, and suffered and almost died, or relatives did die for the sake of innocent Jewish people. It'd be irrelevant whether you live your life like Corey Ten Boom or Adolf Hitler who slaughtered innocent people. Uh, a million years from now, uh, you know, these two will have ceased to exist. Everybody they ever influenced for good or for bad will have ceased to exist. Eventually, the whole universe is going to blow up and cease to exist. It makes absolutely no difference unless you acknowledge the existence of God in life after death and punishments and rewards. See, that's what the, the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. Everything is futile under the sun, whether it's big building projects or uh, wealth or, or gaining knowledge. Everything is worthless. It's futile unless you put God in the equation. Once you put God in the equation, then Solomon concludes that even our thoughts, not just our actions and words, but even our thoughts take on eternal significance. Um, you know, when I, when I debated Jeffrey J. Lauder at University of North Carolina, the Chapel Hill campus, at a major, it was in September 1999, a major atheist conference, one of the biggest atheist conferences uh, of our generation, uh, when I brought this up, Jeffrey J. Lauder said, oh, that's an appeal to emotion. emotion. And I came back in my rebuttal period. I said, no, that's it's an appeal to fact. That's the way it is. And I was looking at it, like 200 atheists and like a dozen uh, uh, Christians that came. They found out about it. They came from a seminary. But almost all the audience were some of the leading atheists from all over the world who had flown there for this conference. And, and I said, look, it makes perfect sense that I got a bumper sticker that says Jesus saves. Well, God loves you. Because I believe in Jesus, I'm being perfectly consistent with my worldview. But it makes no sense whatsoever that you would celebrate, yeah, after I die, I'm going to cease to exist. That you'd have bumper stickers of Darwin fish. That you would celebrate that. I said, it makes no sense that you would travel halfway around the globe to show up for an atheist conference to celebrate that after you die, you're going to cease to exist for all eternity. And everything you worked for is eventually going to die in the death of the universe. I said, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then I said, in fact, as a matter of fact, I don't even know why you people get up in the morning. And now, now when I, when I said that, I thought, oh Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. These are, you know, these are, di these are dignified, these are dignified people. I didn't mean to trash talk them. You know, I thought for, I had a flashback being back on Jersey with my buddies on the block and, and I thought, no, this, you know, I, pardon the English, but this ain't right. You know, I thought, I'm sorry. You know, so I just shut up after I said, I don't even know why you people get up in the morning. I just shut up. And I thought I was going to get heckled, and there was nothing but silence. And some atheists were sitting there looking at me with their mouths open. Some were looking at the floor and swaying back and forth. And I remember when I was, uh, I used the, they had a break, and I used the bathroom at that conference. And uh, so I was in a stall, and I guess there were two atheists at the urinals, and and uh, one of them said, well, uh, how do you think it's going right now? The other guy said, well, at least I don't think anybody's going to change their mind today. So it didn't sound like things were going real well. But a big issue was this, this and I didn't, I didn't consider this argument that strong until that day. When a lot of these atheists were saying, you know, I've given like 60, 70 years of my life to study, and it's all going to blow up in the death of the universe if I'm right. Why do I even do it? Um, you know, if Jesus is real, it makes sense that we we got a reason to get out of bed in the morning. If Jesus is real, it makes sense that we share Jesus with others. If atheism is true, you know, the Apostle Paul, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It makes no sense. Other common aspects, a reason to be optimistic about the future, very similar to what I just said, to have hope. You know, Everybody who gets out of bed in the morning acts like there's hope. But let me tell you, if the carpenter from Nazareth, if his corpse rotted in the tomb, there is no hope. If Jesus of Nazareth didn't rise from the dead, then human history is a big cruel joke where some people come into existence and accomplish great things, others come into existence and don't accomplish much, but in the end you die, you cease to exist. That's one big, ugly, cruel joke. But if Jesus of Nazareth is who he claimed to be, 
and conquered death, conquered the grave, then there is hope. Yet these atheists, they live like there's hope. What hope can an atheist offer us? I mean, I mean, you skip down, fear of death. When's the last time you saw somebody on their deathbed call for their favorite atheist philosopher? <laughs> no, I mean, even, even atheists, if atheists are going to call for somebody other than their relatives, they're going to call for a priest or a preacher. I've got stories of all kinds of agnostics back home in Jersey. One guy, my brother-in-law's dad, uh, was, was screaming uh, his dying words were, I want Christ water, I want Christ water, I want Christ water. They had no idea what he's talking about. I think he wanted to be baptized. Okay? Story after story. My mother on her deathbed, uh, hours before she died, she was crying out and said she wanted to speak to the Baptist minister. She's Roman Catholic. And uh, so my sister Marie and the healthcare worker said, you want a priest? She said, no, the Baptist minister, the Baptist minister. And she was getting all irate, you know, the drug she was on too. She was real incoherent. She said, no, the Baptist minister from Washington State. And so my sister Marie realized she was talking about me because when I became a minister, my mother said, what kind of minister are you? And I said, non-denomination. She said, what is that? I said, ah, we're kind of like the Baptist. So from then on, I was no... I, I was no longer her son. I was the Baptist minister from Washington State. But on her deathbed, hours before she died, she was crying. I didn't know about that. I didn't know she said that. But 20 minutes later, I called her not knowing that. And she was incoherent at that time. She was only grunting and groaning. And all I could say, I had given her the gospel message so many times. You know, I get to the point she'd just about throw plates at me, you know. and uh, But I just said, trust Jesus, Mom. Nothing else. Don't trust anything else but Jesus. Only Jesus can save you, Ma. Trust Jesus. And with the hour, within hours, she was dead. It wasn't until the funeral that I found out. And uh, so fear of death, we don't, we don't just fear dying, you know, the pain of dying. We fear what's on the other side. And for some reason, uh, a lot of people will call for a priest and a preacher. I don't see, uh, I don't see some hotline to your favorite atheist philosopher on that. Uh, a guarantee that evil will be defeated. Atheists point to evil and they say, look, the problem of evil, therefore Christianity can't be true. Look, hey, that sounds real good in a philosophy lecture hall. In the West, where uh, there's the most comfort, okay, Christianity, biblical Christianity is in decline. In third world countries where suffering is at its height, that's where Christianity is growing at a faster rate than at any other time in the history of mankind. When people suffer, they turn to God. Uh, but evil is not some philosophical problem. It's a real existential problem, a real problem of human experience, and real problems demand real solutions. Apart from the incarnation, God the Son becoming a man, the death, resurrection, and return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know of no guarantee that evil will be defeated. In the end, the ultimate solution to the problem of evil, his name is Jesus. And... Uh, uh, but evil is not something he's like, oh, I've got a thing you never, you Christians never thought of, evil. Look, if it wasn't for evil, God would not have written the Bible. If it wasn't for Genesis chapter 3, we wouldn't need a Savior, okay? God was not like freaked out about, oh, I never thought of evil. The problem of evil, no. He wrote the Bible as a response to the problem of evil. Feelings of guilt, I used to think, ah, that's not a strong argument for God until I started reading Sigmund Freud. Here's this guy is, he's trying to argue against God's existence, and he's got to try to explain away why everybody feels guilty, even when they sin, when no one's looking. You know? And it's kind of like people are more important, persons are more important than rules. Yet even when we sin alone and there's no person that we hurt, we still feel like we violated some, some kind of a rule, like we've uh, betrayed some type of person. I would argue that even when, we are, when we're all alone and we sin, there's at least three persons we have offended. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Sigmund Freud spent the bulk of his work trying to explain away guilt because he knew deep down inside, if guilt is real, if we really are guilty, then there really has to be a moral lawgiver. And... Uh, so I think that's a strong indication that God has given us. Then human rights, respect for human life. 
In a world without God, there are no human rights. If we're nothing but mere molecules in motion, if you go outside, if, we go, if we're on a break, and uh, you go outside and you see me and I kick him out in the dirt, you're not going to run to Chris and say, don't bring him back, he's a bully, he kicked him out in the dirt. Okay? But if you see me outside kicking a human being, okay, if you're big enough, you're going to tackle me. If you're not big enough, then you might run to Chris or call 911 or something. But there's a difference between human beings and a mound of dirt. Not if atheism is true. If atheism is true, man is mere molecules in motion. There is no basis for human rights. Every time an atheist is taking a stand for human rights, okay, he's acting like Christianity is true. Uh, and then we talked about this already, free will and human responsibility. The existence of the human non-material soul, it, it, if our choices are not really choices, they're just chemical reactions that occur in the brain, we're not responsible for our actions. But even atheists hold people responsible for their actions. Okay? That's like they did the, 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 the studies where they prodded the human brain. You can read about it in Gary Habermas and J.P. Moreland's work on uh, uh, immortality, and I forget the... Uh, Something about life after death and all. But they prodded the human brain. They got people to raise their right hands. And then, and then the, the doctors asked them, okay, what, what happened? And they always said, they, they thought they would say, well, I chose to raise my right hand, and so I raised my right hand. Because you push the right button in the brain, and there it goes. But instead, the people would say, you rose my right hand. You raised my right hand. Sometimes the people the right hand would raise, they didn't like it involuntarily an involuntary movement, they took their left hand and they pulled it down because they did not like it moving without them making that choice. And what these scientists discovered, the choice was not being made in the body. The choice was being made somewhere else and then that choice acted upon the brain and set things in motion. Um, but if there is no human soul, um, then we can't be held responsible for our actions. So in conclusion, mere molecules in motion combined with time and chance cannot explain any of these factors. When you go over these factors, the atheist must either deny the reality of these aspects of human experience and say, well, there are no moral absolutes. Well, then, if there's no moral absolutes, no such thing as wrong, why do you call Christians wrong for wanting to te teach people about uh, the Bible? in the schools. There's no such thing as wrong, and Christians are never wrong. Uh, they either deny the reality of these aspects of human experience or say they're just there. But then atheism becomes a non-worldview, an anti-worldview, because worldviews are supposed to explain things, not explain them away or say they're just there. In the 1940s, and I'll close with this, Bertrand Russell, uh, the great British philosopher and, and, and agnostic, um, he debated Frederick Copleston, a Jesuit priest, on the existence of God. And, and uh, Frederick Copleston asked him, the origin of the universe, what should we say about that? And Bertrand Russell responded by saying, we should say it's just there and that's all. And I would argue atheism does that with more than just the universe. The universe had a beginning, um, yet we don't believe in God. The universe is just there. What about moral absolutes? Well, either moral absolutes don't exist or they're just there. Uh, well, what about absolute truth? Well, either there's no absolute truth or it's just there. I mean, if you're looking for answers, and if you're looking, if you're looking for answers, okay, and you're looking for solutions, don't look to the atheistic worldview. If you're looking for answers, uh, look in that book called the Bible, the Word of God. That's where you'll find the answers. Wisdom from our Creator, uh, not from the atheistic worldview. As the scriptures say, professing to be wise, because they reject God, they become fools. Um, Chris, did you want to close us with a word of prayer? Okay. Um, if you bow, bow your heads, Father in Jesus' precious name, uh, we thank you so much uh, for the hard work of Chris. And, and for putting together this conference. Uh, we thank you so much for the people that came here. 
Um, and, and we thank you that, uh, that you were glorified throughout this conference. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would take what we learned and through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, that we would be your representatives, we would be your people, and that we would proclaim your truth in love with, uh, with our non-believing friends. And so I, I, I just pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would bless this conference and that uh, you would bring out of this conference uh, much fruit, uh, fruit for your kingdom and, and not our own. And uh, Lord, but we thank you most of all for not only creating us, but we thank you most of all uh, for sending your son and allowing your son to be slaughtered in our place to be a substitute sacrifice for our sins and then for raising him from the dead to conquer death for us. And we thank you that you loved us even though we're unlovable, that you loved us even though we declared war against you, that you loved us so much that you sent your son and sacrificed him in our place. We pray that you receive all the glory and that you mold us into the kind of people that you want us to be for your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.